Oh, oh. <laughs> Hello there, gang. Did you write, George? Hello. Uh, yeah, I guess tonight, let's see, we have Zsa Zsa Gabor, Marty Rock III, Bertrand Russell. We've got a nice mixed bag tonight, and uh, Tiny Tim will be around, too. Uh, Tiny Tim. <laughs> human being in distress. Uh, this is, uh, I, I'm just going to have to warn you before we get underway tonight, uh, by way of a disclaimer, this is an exceedingly cute night. And, uh, well, you know, there are some days when you feel that you're very cute. You have those days, don't you, Walt? Absolutely. And uh, I mean, it's very subjective. There's no doubt about it. You know, those are, those are the days when you're when you're slapping on the uh, aqua velva. And what is it? Uh, all, all right, I'll, I'll award you a brass fig leggie with bronze oak leaf palm out there, fellow victims, fellow strugglers in the great 20th century mire and muck of existence, fellow fighters. I'll award you the brass fig leaf with bronze oak leaf palm. What? What is it that wows the ladies? Now, come on, be serious. Now, I, I don't. I, I'm, I'm asking you to, to be serious about this. I don't want any rotten comments. Speaking of rotten comments, we have a sad little note here tonight. Holy smokes! Oh, this is so sad. Caracas, Venezuela. Hector Alberto, a beautiful green and yellow parrot, I mean parrot, was released after 24 hours of detention for insulting a magistrate in a courtroom. The magistrate, Tomas Escobar, had just solved the case of the ownership of the parrot when suddenly, quote, it suddenly started to cry out the dirtiest names, the juror said. I just hate to hear what's happening. All over the world, it's going downhill. Every place should turn. I wonder whether Peggy Fitzgerald has heard about this dirty bird. The parrot was locked up and was then returned to its legal owner, a very upright middle-aged woman. Before the insults, Judge Escobar had determined that the disputed parrot belonged to Mrs. Juana Gomez and not to a neighbor of hers who was accused of being a parrot rustler. Would you please sneak that in there, please, for me? Come on, come on, come on, sneak it in there. Blue is for a rotten, dirty, stinky, yellow dog. Bring it in there. And so tonight, folks. Oh, I'm weeping. Yes, I'm a weeping. I'm a weeping for all of us. That poor old dirty bird. Just a hang in there on his perch. Build them out as fast as he can pick them up. One of the best words, I don't know my Spanish. You dirty, that was sexy, folks, what he said. Oh, ho, ho. I'm going to drink muddy water. Muddy, muddy water. You ain't going to get away with it. You ain't going to get away with it. Keep on a walking. Till that big old ocean comes sneaking up around my kneecaps. Ba ba boo 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 boo. And then sneaks on a fire. And then one more, more, more step. And that old hat's gonna float. I'm gonna drink muddy water. Muddy, muddy, muddy water. That's what you've done, done to me, baby, and I know it's your blood. Crummy, 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 boy. Ba ba boo boo boo. That's enough of that. It's a very serious. This is a family radio station, and we like to keep it here in the family. Speaking of keeping it in the family, I have a, somebody, one of my uh, listener types here. I'm putting this in my great vast file of eternal trivia so that 5,000 years from now they'll know what it was really like. Would you please, if you will, sneak that in quietly and subtly behind me? That's it. That's right. 
this kid writes to me from Rumson, New Jersey. And she says, recently the school I go to, from which I will graduate this June, published the Forest Dale Book of Verse in school in Rumson. She says, I thought you would like to hear some of the poems in it. She spells it P-O-M-E-S. Here are some of the poems that appear in the new Forest Dale Book of Verse. It was written by the kids in my school. And here's one typical little cry out of the wilderness. My desk. My crummy old desk. My desk. My desk. It's such a mess. I couldn't care less. <laughs> that was written by Brenda Raymond, fourth grade. Some guy about, about 20 years from now is going to have a bad time. Knee deep in potato peelings, sardine cans, and busted beer bottles. And she's going to holler out, I couldn't care less, you bum. Remember the old slogan, friends? As the child is, so goes the man. Also, as the chick is, so goes the uh, large lady who's married to this poor, downtrodden worm. Sleepy worms! Here's another poem. Another kid from the Forestdale Book of Verse. The Worm. When the earth is turned in spring... The worms are fat as anything, and birds come flying all around to eat the worms right off the ground. They like worms as much as I like milk and apple pie. And once, when I was very young, I put a worm right on my tongue. I didn't like the taste a bit, so I didn't swallow it. But, oh, it makes my mother squirm because she thinks I ate that worm. <laughs> <laughs> That's what kids really think of. It was written by Deborah Johnson, who's now in the sixth grade. <laughs> How about a poem to lima beans? Want to hear that one? Lima beans. <laughs> well, only a kid would think of writing, writing a poem about lima beans. Lima beans. When we have lima beans to eat, I concentrate on eating my meat. She likes lima beans. That's Karen Shaw, fourth grade. All right, that's enough. That's enough. Now, teeny, teeny, teeny. I'll never forget one time the poem that Schwartz wrote in the John at the Warren G. Harding School. It was a gasser. And it cost him three months of detention. But he caught it on the fat part of the bat. Did he write it on the wall? No, that isn't exactly where he wrote it, Walt. He wrote it in some place that was a little more interesting than that. And it caused a little excitement. I'll let you think where he wrote it. Okay, Coach, we have women children. I don't want to give kids any ideas. Speak of kids and ideas, you know. Uh, I, I don't know quite how to approach this. Uh, I, I really don't because uh, it's a very touchy thing that I'm about to bring up. And, uh, you know, sometimes when you, when you deal with these touchy things in this explosive world, you never know which way it's going to go. You know, it's, it's, almost like, uh, it's almost like nuclear fission. You, you, you just hit the critical point and no telling how far it's going to go. It just goes, you know, all over the place. So I don't quite know how to approach this. Now, all of you people know that, that, um, well, how can I say this? That, that well, we, we live in two, you know, we live in a world where there's two kinds of people. There's the, there's the right-thinking people and, and, um, well, there's the others. And yeah, it's it's always almost axiomatic that the person you're listening to or the person you're watching on television or, or you're reading in a magazine is one of the right thinkers, right? Well, I wish that was so. I mean, because you're, you're not listening tonight, friends, to a right thinker. I just thought I'd warn you that that there's a real terrible rotten spot in me. It's just rotten, and and uh, I don't want anybody to. Be misled. Don't don't think for a minute that I'm nice. 
Such rotten spine. You know, you've heard the old expression about this barrel with the apples in it. And you know what happens when a rotten apple gets in the barrel? Oh, boy, the next thing you know, all those, every last apple, right, Walt? And that barrel has got green fuzz on it and worms jumping out of the cores and all that stuff. And yeah, I wouldn't want to cause any bad thing. I would not want to corrupt, for example, Fordham Road. I mean, because cause I think Fordham Road is not. I, I, when the sun is shining, I don't think there's a more beautiful sight here in New York than when the sun is shining down. And it's just about twilight, you know, it's just exciting when that, that haze, when that, you know, the Jersey crud is drifting in over the river wall, and you can, and the Monsanto chemical plant is sending all that purple gas over, and it's beautiful. If you look at it a certain way, and you can, you can see the sky arching above you, and to see the thousands of penitents, the, the worshippers all crowding at the magnificent Alexander's on Fordham's road, you know, it, it, it's, it's one of the warmer things in New York, and I wouldn't like to corrupt that, but, I, I read a little piece. Speaking of corruption, this is WOR. It's funny how one thing leads to the next in New York. And uh, we're in Fun City here. I hope you're having your share of fun. I see Mayor Lindsay had a little fun today, but uh, everybody has this fun one way or another. And we have a little note here, friends. Uh, speaking of fun, a few, uh, there are all kinds of hobbies out there. Now, I don't know what your hobby is. Uh, I, I remember the time I, I once told the story about he, how me and Schwartz and Flick got on this uh, who can get the most shocks kick now there's a lot of ways uh, that you can prove that you're chicken or not you know some guys drive their cars at each other other guys jump out of airplanes well one time me and Schwartz and Flick were in this old abandoned house a lot of old abandoned houses out in the woods and we found this house and a lot of old junk in the basement nothing is more exciting than to go through an old house people have left stuff around old pictures and junk and down in the basement we found this box and it had a crank on it. And uh, we opened the box up. Now, M Walt, maybe you might know something about this more than I do. Uh, and it had, a box was made out of, uh, I think it was like oak. You know, these old boxes they used to make very official uh, medical cases and stuff out of. And we opened the, the top of this thing. And inside, it had a list of diseases. Very exotic diseases, like Qatar. Now... <laughs> <laughs> do you have six string guitar or do you... <laughs> a terrible person okay all right all right yes it's, it's my cute night and uh they had things like colic uh scurvies uh oh yeah they, oh, a lot of do you know that there's a disease called the glunts my old man used to the glunts was terrible but uh, that's something else again. I don't want to bring family history on it. Who you know? That's a personal thing. And they had all these diseases, and it told after each disease the number of minutes a day that this machine should be used to treat that disease. Like would say three minutes, or would say five minutes, or one minute. Each disease had a number of minutes per day, and it said a very official looking look. It looked like a medical chart on the top. It says medical prescription for various types of ailments and things like heaves. Uh, well, they, they used to get the heaves a lot in Indiana, especially on Saturday night. But uh, that was something else. And they, they had these little numbers and figures and Schwartz looked at this thing. What is this thing? And it had, had, had wires in it with electrodes and handles, brass handles. And it was old, very old. It was, it was in the middle of a whole bunch of old tires and Old footballs and fielders' mitts and round tables, you know, the kind of tables people play pinochle on. And there this thing was down in the basement. So we dragged it out and dusted it off. And it had a crank, a brass crank that you would hook to the side of it. You stick it in the side. It was like a some kind of a little uh, generator. And it had magnets in there. So Schwartz turned the thing and he goes, go, 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 And it had a flywheel on it. The faster you turned, the faster it would go. Well, Flick grabbed the hold of the two handles. There were two brass handles, and Schwartz was turning this baby, and whoa, it knocked him 20 feet. I'm telling you, Flick took off like a $2 skyrocket. I'm telling you, he hit his head up against the rock, and he got up, and Schwartz says, wow, and look at that, it gives you shocks, holy smokes. And it was then and there that the new game was born. Immediately, Schwartz says, I'll bet it wouldn't shock me. 
And Flick says, okay, I'll crank it, wise guy. And Flick is, you know, his hands are turning blue and his eyeballs are still sticking out of his sockets of his head. And he starts to crank it. Schwartz is holding on to it. Well, we, every day for about a month, played at that baby. Until we could take almost, well, we could take anything that thing could give. You could crank that thing for 20 minutes. And Schwartz is just standing there, and his teeth are lighting up in the dark, and, and his, you know, his ears are whistling Dixie. I could hold this baby for 50 minutes. And so we graduated that. I'll tell you something that I don't want, I don't want any of you kids to get any ideas. We graduated then to putting a plug in the electric light socket and holding it. <laughs> Who could hold it the longest? You ought to try that one. Well, of course, from that time on, you know, you get hooked on the hard stuff. You start out with the soft stuff, you know. Yeah, a lot of you guys think that, you know, smoking stuff like pot is innocent. No, no. You, 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 begin, to, you begin to look at the hard stuff. Oh, yeah, it, it even got to the point where, uh, well, I don't want to get the... No, I better not. I better not mention this. But, uh, well, I just better not. Because there's women and children out there, and there are a lot of squeamish poodles and that who listen at this hour. But, uh... We got to the point where we began to move on the bigger and fatter directions. Ford spark coils. I mean, we began to look at want ads for used electric chairs, little things like that. You start getting hooked on this. And uh, I'm not going to tell you how it ended. Because it really isn't important. Well, I will tell you how it ended. Schwartz discovered that there was a place out in... In, in town, where they sold, you know, like like Manny Moe and Jack, the Pep Boys. Well, they had all these car, you know, stuff for car cuckoos. You could get mirrors that had reverse lights on them and a little skull and crossbones for your gear shift knob, all that, you know, aesthetic stuff. You get, you get it, yeah, you could get an Elsie the Cow that you could put in your back window that uh, when you were going to turn left, the udders lit up green. When you're turning right, they lit up red. These, these, this is true slob art. You know, this is the kind of stuff. <laughs> well, I'm telling you, I'm just telling you what you could get. You could get Elmer the Bull, but I can't describe to you what that did, but that's another thing. I don't want anybody to get any wrong ideas. And so uh, he discovered that you could get down there. You could get a thing that you could attach to the car. Did you ever hear the thing you can attach to your car to, quote, protect it against thievery? You hook it up to the battery, and when the car's parked and somebody wanders over and puts his hand on it, pow! There's a blue flash and the smell of ozone, and he's ionized. You ever seen one of them? You ever seen one of those, huh? I mean, Al Schwartz bought one of these babies. It only cost 49 cents. And uh, Flick had this Model A, which we were driving to school all the time, and Schwartz had this idea to hook it up to Model A. So when the car was, you know, not around, you never know. Somebody might want to steal Flick's skull and crossbones off his gear shift knob. You know, those are pretty. He also had one of these these beautiful gear, one of these steering wheel knobs. You know, the kind of steering wheel knob that that was was. Uh, I remember it was it was white and caramel colored marble. And I'll tell you, it caught him one time in the pancreas. What a shot. That Because we were riding along a, a, a streetcar track. And you know how when your car gets in the streetcar track? Well, we tried to turn left, and the wheels continued to go right. That thing spun around twice. And I'll tell you, it, that, that, that steering wheel knob hit, hit Flick's pancreas with a shot. You could hear, boing. I don't know whether you can rupture your pancreas, but he had one the shape and the size of a major league professional football. After that, he got shot. Well, of course, these were all little things that were part of our world, and we wanted to protect them. Also, I must admit, there were, I suppose you can say we were human beings. There were ulterior motives. You know how you do. And Schwartz hooked up to Flick's car. This shocker. That's very easy to do. All you had to do was stick it under the hood and hook it up to the battery. And then there was a little plate that you'd take to the to the firewall, and you would screw this thing out to any one of the screws of the firewall, and there she was. She was ready to go. And they had a switch in there. And you'd throw that switch on, and whenever the switch was off in the car, this was on. Got it? There was only one thing wrong. He did not tell Flick. And he hooked this baby up. And it was a 
have a decent spring day, just like this day. A little moisture in the air, a little mist. Which, for any of you who are electric cuckoos, know what it means. A little mist. And uh, the car was parked outside of the school in the back with a couple of other cars that kids owned. And Schwartz said to me, I've hooked up my electric shocker on Flick's Model A. I said, gee, that's good. Nobody will steal the Model A now, will they? He said, no. I said, does Flick know? There was a pregnant silence. And we went our separate ways. And that night, at 4.15, immediately following football practice, Flick is walking along, innocent as a jaybird, swinging along. You never know when lightning is going to strike, friends. I'm just bringing this out to you for those of you who may at certain points be a little a little casual about things, a little take things for granted. You never know when a cloud is going to descend on you. You know, I am beginning to suspect that Chicken Little was no dummy. Chicken Little was no fool. I don't know. Uh, what was that great book about uh, Chicken Little. It was uh, somebody about uh, it's on the tip of my tongue. Mrs. Boggs and the Cabbage Patch. Any of you ever read that book? Mrs. Boggs and the Cabbage No, it was Mrs. Biggs and the Cabbage Patch. That's it. Mrs. Biggs and the Cabbage Patch. And somehow Chicken Little was involved in that. And these things are all part of the great miasma of myth that surrounds each one of us. The zeitgeist the existence the total mythology, the thing, the place you wander through, people by Jack Armstrong, Phil Rizzuto, all the rest of it. It's all there, this great thing all around us. Orson Welles, Chicken Little, and Minnie Mouse. And they're all there, you know, all the great people. And Flick comes wandering out of football practice, and he's swinging his, swinging his little football practice sack in a little bag you carry along there at spring practice. On top of the world, the mist is coming down. I was about maybe 75 feet behind Flick. I'm walking along with Jack Morton, and I believe it was Eileen Akers that afternoon. I had a thing on her that spring. And a little to my left and just ahead of me was Schwartz, walking along like an evil-eyed vulture, waiting to see, observing the scene. Flick is swinging along casually, and he's got his keychain. This was a period when the keychain was a very hip thing. You had a long chain would hook to your belt. You'd swing it like that, you know. And he had these little dice on his keychain. I remember, little red dice with white dots. He's swinging his keychain there. Well, Flick walked up to the Model A. He reached out. He grabbed the handle of the door. Schwartz stopped with his mouth hanging open waiting. And I'm walking along casually, pretending nothing's about to occur. Flick grabbed the handle of the door, and nothing happened. Nothing happened. He just opened it and got in and says, Come on, you guys, I can't wait all day for crying out loud. It was a flop. Don't believe ads, friends. You know those ads that say your satisfaction guaranteed? A laugh a minute. This thing was advertised, satisfied. Why, any crook could have come along there and carried the seeds, stolen the gas tank out of that thing. He could have taken the radiator core out of that baby and nothing would have happened. Just picked it right up, you know. And Schwartz gives a look back at me. He shrugs his shoulders and I said, well, you can't win them all, Schwartz. 49 cents shot. And so we walk up to the car. Flick is sitting in there. He's got the motor running. <laughs> Model A sounds. I can do a good Model A imitation. <laughs> Sound the Model A. It's Model A with bad valves, however. And uh, so Schwartz goes around to the other side, grabs the handle of the door, boom! Schwartz is knocked flat on his you know what. I'm telling you, he staggered backward and slid the backward for 15 feet in the gravel and didn't move. He just lay spread out, turning blue. Well, I rushed over to Schwartz. Flick jumped out of the car and said, What's the matter with Schwartz? I said, I don't know. Schwartz is laying there, and I could see his, his eyelids fluttering. 
and the clouds hung overhead. The birds flew through the mist. Eileen Akers walked by and gave him a kick in the ribs when she went on down towards the igloo. Kids are like that. Schwartz lay there flat out. And he looked up at Flick, and there was a look of pure malevolent hatred. Schwartz suddenly hated Flick. The fake. And Flick looked down like the, 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 the pure light the, of elfin gold and sweet lovingness. The look of Billy Butt. Looked down at Schwartz and says, what's the matter, Schwartz? Schwartz took 15 minutes to recover his speech. And for over two weeks, he spoke with a distinct stutter. I just thought you ought to know, the story has no meaning, friends. None whatsoever. Oh, don't worry. None whatsoever. I just thought you ought to know. It ain't all that it looks like. Ever. And don't worry. Don't remember and don't forget. Look out what's behind you. It may catch you. Going away. Bubba. The more you eat, the more you want. Yeah, Cracker Jack Fox says, friends, today ain't fooling. Bubba, 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 bubba. Gonna drink mother water. Gonna drink mother water tonight. No meaning. Oh, for those of you who would like to experiment, uh, we'd like to recommend Rosetta <laughs> for you electric cuckoos. And that uh, we've got Rosetta here, friends, and they've got all the makings. Anything you want to make in the way of electricity. I'm not suggesting. I'm just telling you, they got a lot of stuff down there, you know. Almost anything you'd care to buy in the way of electricity, if you'd like to, you know, try it. Blowing up the neighborhood or anything. I, I'm, you know, there's just a lot of things you can do with electricity, and they have almost anything you'd care to try. They've got the air conditioners, they've got burglar alarms. By the way, you can do a lot of funny things with burglar alarms if you have uh, a little Boy Scout ingenuity. And uh, they've got, uh, this is a goodie, an electronic fly trap. <laughs> can you imagine yourself building an electronic fly trap, man sized? <laughs> oh, I'm terrible, Rotten. Uh, that's uh, Rosetta, R-O-S-E-T-T-A. And they have three great stores. One at 79 Chambers Street, 75 West 45th Street, right off 6th Avenue, and on down around the City Hall, two parks west of that great big... Uh... Gee, the City Hall's been getting some great publicity lately, hasn't it? That's very... Well, just two blocks west of the City Hall is... The big new was at a shop at 73 Murray Street. Okay? Now, look, uh, I guess they're asleep right now, huh? The women and children have, have disappeared. Now we can get down to the nitty-gritty. Right, gang? All right, we set up a little smoke, a little dust. Listen to this one. I want you to picture the scene. Now, just picture the scene. Don't, don't listen to any news item with that abstract thing that it's print. Picture the scene. Picture it. Here's a note from Tehran. Now, you know, Tehran. All you can think of in, you know, Tehran is President Roosevelt signing a paper and all that jazzy stuff. But other things happen in Tehran. A 17-year-old Iranian girl. Now, have you ever met an Iranian girl? They're worth meeting. I can tell you that. A 17-year-old Iranian girl miscalculated the length of her miniskirt and was expelled from a math examination at Abedin in Tehran. When she sat down, the skirt revealed the detailed notes she had written on her thigh. I just let that soak in out there. 
<laughs> I just want you to picture the seats. <laughs> Wow, you know, I read that. I says, holy smokes, you know. <laughs> well, now, I've been in, you know, many a moment in the subway when I, I'm sure that a lot of chicks around me have miscalculated the length of their miniskirt. But uh, I thought, what a beautiful moment that must have been in the world of higher education. And could you see the stunned silence for a minute there in the class? This chick is sitting, probably doesn't even know it. You know, she's sitting there waiting for the blue books to come back. <laughs> And all of a sudden, Abdul, who's next to her, says, Hey, hey, look at baby. Oh, um, dollar, um, dollar. Oh, God, um, dollar. He's telling her, pull it down, baby. <laughs> and the professor says, Abdul, um, dollar, um, dollar. And he looks, and there is every known formula, neatly inscribed. Well, all of you are. I mean, I know that the reason I, I, I started out tonight by telling you that you listen to a rotten person. I read that piece, and I cackled. I got a fiendish cackle, and I knocked over about four books in the office. Three rats ran out of the bottom drawer, and the cockroaches were running around. I cackled again, and then I put the piece down on the desk. And I am not a person to throw stones. I am not here going to be high and mighty and excoriate that chick for writing the formulae on her thigh. You are listening to a man who had one of the worst experiences I can imagine that a scholar would have. Going to high school, one fantastically sickening, rotten, crummy, stinking spring day that had to do with my attempt to cheat. Have you ever cheated? In an exam? Well, listen, I'll tell you, I know guys that have gone even to such an extent, friends, <laughs> to have black light. I know. Oh, oh, yes, you know. Oh, you can you can do all kinds. I knew guys that had formula written on the inside of their watch band. I've known guys that had, oh, you know, had, had stuff written inside of uh, cigarette packages. They had stuff written in there. I, yeah, I, had, I knew one guy that hollowed out that worked for about a month hollowing out a pencil, a wooden pencil. He took the top of it off, see? And he hollowed it out. And inside this pencil, he put a very thin roll of tissue paper that had the necessary to get him through this ordeal. He put it in there, see? And then he put the top back on and then forgot it when he came to class. He just left it back in the room. Well, I'm going to tell you what happened to me. I figured I had a, a foolproof scene going. Now, I, I, I was in my second year. I was taking chemistry. Now, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you right here now, right now at this point, if there's anything that I hate, it's a person who understands chemistry. Now, every, you know, I, any, any other class I could fake my way, I, could, I was fine. English, I could, uh, you give me three words out of any book in the English language and I can write you a 25 page detailed analysis of that book and get away with it. I even wrote three new battles in the War of the Roses, commented on them with cross references, got away with it, and even got a thing back from the history teacher says, Superb, superb research. Well, I made up my own battles. He couldn't even find them in the books. Well, I could, I could do that with almost anything. Except chemistry. There was something, there was a block. I hated chemistry lab. Oh, did I hate lab. We'd go there and stand around with those rubber aprons on. And, uh, we had these chemistry workbooks. And it just nothing ever worked. I would go and get potassium, and I would get the magnesium chloride. Is there such a thing as magnesium? I don't even know. There is magnesium chloride. <laughs> I'd get stuff like silver nitrate and baking powder and a little jello or something, whatever it is you had to get, and I'd mix all this stuff up and put it in a... Is there such a thing as a crucible? Yes. You'd put it in a crucible, and then you have a Bunsen burner, right? And I would light the Bunsen burner and burn my eyebrows off. 
And I'd get the Bunsen burner going, and I'd put the crucible out, and the stuff would start boiling, and I had little pincers. Do you have little pincers where you pick it up with? A little pincers. And I had some kind of, I remember always, I had some kind of a little screen that I had to keep putting on top of this thing, and I kept burning my hand on the screen. And I'd hold it on there, and I would light the flame, and, and uh, 15 minutes later, I was supposed to measure it. It was supposed to come out. I remember it was always supposed to come out to 1.75 milligrams. I don't know what it was supposed to, 1.75 milligrams of what, but it was 1.75 milligrams of uh, whatever it was, C-O-L-O-H-2-M-7 to the square root of 3, whatever it is this stuff was. Oh, it was my, I hated it. There are some classes that you just absolutely hate, and those are the ones you cheat in. That's right. Those are the ones you cheat in. Well, I hated this class. Now, there were a lot of things. First of all, it was because it was a memory class, and I hate to memorize things. I mean, anything where I can figure it out, I will go along with. But memorizing stuff, I cannot do this. I, I, I had this terrible experience one time where we had to memorize this poem. And uh, I still remember the, uh, the opening lines of the poem that I spent two months trying to memorize. I tear her tattered ensign down. Or is it, I tear down her tattered ensign? See, I can't even remember that. I still have that same block. I hated it. Oh, I'd, and I get this sick feeling every time I would go into a class where you had to memorize something. I think this sick feeling. Don't call on me. Don't call on me. I hope, I hope, that, I hope this bright folk get struck by lightning. I'd sit in the back and I had to shift the eye that I worked out. So nobody could conceivably call on me because you couldn't actually get me in focus. I kept shifting back and forth and drifting in and out. Of, of uh, I would go into a fourth dimension. But that chemistry class. And we had a guy named Mr. Jenkins who taught it. And he hated phonies. And he had a smirk. And he had this, yeah, he had this smirk. And he had this thing on the, he, he dug every chick in the class. He had a thing on chicks, you know. There is something about chemistry teachers and girls. I don't know what it is. They, they, oh, it's true. I'm not, I'm not inventing anything. You know, I went to school. It's true. Every chemistry teacher I ever knew was a lech. It was terrible. And they, they'd walk around in, in, in lab. I remember I was with this girl one time. This, this girl was my lab partner. And I'm trying to impress her. You know, I'm burning my hands and the Bunsen burner is shooting out all over the place. And my, my laboratory, my workbook is on fire. And, oh, it is terrible. You know, she's saying, oh, gee, we've got to get this thing finished. And Mr. Jenkins comes over and leans over her. And the perfume is rising from her hair. And he is describing valences. I, I never knew anybody could make valences, a discussion of how valences are calculated into a, into a, into a rotten, sneaky proposal. I mean, you, you never, you know, how can you make valences and, and negative ions into something obscene? But he did it. And so I just make it in that, that class was terrible. And also, uh, Josue, my buddy Josue, he never, we, we just, we, we fought our way through that class. Well, now here it is. It is, June, and we better get it. I mean, the final exam is coming up, and it was one of those final exams where you have to memorize about five thousand different types of formulae and uh, show their derivation, one thing and another. I, I couldn't even understand them. All I know is that uh, let's see, what did I remember? I remember one thing out of it. Uh, yes, um, uh, here's what I remember. Uh, C is carbon. Is that right? It is. It is right. It's right, George. <laughs> C is carbon. That's right. And I remember that sugar is a carbon compound, right? How do you like that? That's so dumb. That's right. Uh, of course, I, I had a few other weak spots, but the, the, I was strong in that department. And so it was spring, see? And I figured I had this great technique on how to cheat. The only time that I ever cheated, I had a pair of kid tennis shoes. Now, I wore kid tennis shoes in the spring. The low-cut types, you know, the boater types. And I wore these babies to spring always because I used to wear them to football practice and all that stuff. I had these low-cuts and they were blue. A denim blue. Got it? 
And I, it hit me one night, I'm sitting in the kitchen and I'm desperate. I'm going to flunk. I'm go absolutely going to flunk this, this crummy chemistry class. And I figured out a way of beating the scene. In the tongue, inside the tongue of my innocent denim blue kid boater type low cut tennis shoes. One night at the kitchen table, my mother had no idea what I was doing, at the kitchen table, I had a pen and I carefully inscribed inside the tongue of my shoes every formula that I knew that I needed to squeak by with a D minus. I didn't write everything down. I just, I figured if I got 70%, I'd make it. That's all I wanted. I just wanted life. I didn't want success. I didn't want happiness. I did not want fame. I did not want dross or money. I just wanted life. I wanted to get out of there with a D minus. And I wrote these things down, one after the other, very carefully. This was the night before the big class. And then the next morning, I got up with that feeling of confidence. I am going in at last prepared. And I figured, what I figured, see, was that if I sat down and to, you know, to do my, to do my work, I would sit down there, see, and I would absent-mindedly open up the laces of my shoes, see, and like loosen my shoes, because my feet are hurting, see. And I could sit there and pull one foot up, see, I always sat like that, pull one foot up while I'm working. And I could look down there, and there they'd be. All those formulae that I needed. Well, the first period went by. The second period went by. Now, my chemistry class was fifth period. Lunch was fourth period. Halfway through lunch, I'm standing around eating a peanut butter and jelly sandwich outside with Schwartz when, boom, a spring shower comes down. I never thought about it. You know, and I'm walking around. The water's pouring down. Fifteen minutes later, I'm in class. Here's the little book. There are the examination questions on the board. I casually open up my, my shoelace and I peel back the tongue. And there is nothing but a blackish, bluish, greenish blot of melted, crummy, soaked in ink. All the knowledge of a thousand years of man's chemical research had soaked into my J.C. Penny socks. That was the only exam that I totally failed. But I want to tell you this, friends. I failed it honestly. I did not cheat once. When I missed a question, I missed it honestly. And for that, somehow, I feel that I'm a stronger man, right? <laughs> yes.